Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our spring SALA event featuring Mark Brackett, The Power of Emotional Intelligence to Achieve Well-Being and Success at Home, at School, and at Work. My name is Janine Kay, and I am a parent from Brentwood School, currently serving as the speaker coordinator for the SALA Advisory Board. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank the other members of the SALA Advisory Board. This evening would not be possible without the help and support of Jill Carmel from Harvard Westlake, Susan Krasnitsky from Viewpoint, and Courtney Spikes from Santa Monica High School. I also want to thank each of the SALA member school representatives, which include Arthur School, Brentwood, Briskin Elementary School, Buckley, Crossroads, Geffen Academy, Marro, New Road School, Oakwood, Viewpoint, Westside Neighborhood School, and Windward. Your dedication to being partners with SALA and your continued support in promoting events such as tonight are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Before I introduce Mark Brackett, I wanted to thank everyone on the Zoom tonight for joining us and to those who um, filled out Mark's pre-event survey, thank you. Mark would like for this evening to be interactive and the chat will be enabled for him to see. So please use the chat function. After the presentation, we'll have a short question and answer period. You can submit your questions to the Q&A. Please note that you must actively select the private setting in the Q&A feature if you don't want the audience to see your question. Finally, our guest this evening, Mark Brackett, author of Permission to Feel, is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor for the Child Study Center at Yale University. Mark has published 125 articles on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, decision-making, creativity, relationships, health, and performance. He is the lead developer of RULER, an evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning that has been adopted by more than 2,000 schools, pre-K through high school, across the United States and in other countries. And as a matter of fact, some of our very own member schools on the call this evening. Mark has received numerous awards and he is on the board of directors for the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. And with Pinterest co-founder, Ben Silberman, Mark co-created How We Feel, a free Apple award-winning app designed to enhance well-being, well -being, which you will learn about tonight. Mark also consults with corporations like Facebook, Microsoft, and Google, on integrating emotional intelligence principles into employee training and product design. We feel very fortunate to have Mark join us this evening as he has been the keynote speaker at conferences around the world, including the White House, US Departments of Education, Justice and Defense, the Surgeon General's Office, the New York Times, as well as dozens of education conferences. And with that, it's my great honor and privilege to welcome Mark Brackett to our virtual SALA stage. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Janine, and lovely to be here. So I know that we're doing this virtually, um, clearly, and um, thank you for everyone for showing up. And I look forward to spending um, <clears throat> an hour and a half with all of you in the evening to talk about feelings. That's pretty brave of you to come up for that. I'm going to just put my screen, uh, my PowerPoint up so I can get going. And just to make sure, Janine, just give me a thumbs up that you see my slides. I see your slides. All right, great. And I, Janine, I, just so you know, I, I sent you a little message. I'm going to use you for one of my activities. I hope you don't mind. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> too late. It's too late for you to say no. All right. Well, Good evening, everyone. Uh, you heard plenty about my background from Janine, um, but let me just give you my real bio, which is that my goal is to create a world filled with emotion scientists, and that includes all of you 
as parents of children. And um, we're going to jump right in. Karen Nimi is my new uh, strategist. I wanted to keep her on my slide because um, Karen is the former CEO of Castle uh, and is now working at the Center for Emotional Intelligence with me, uh, which is a great honor. So big question, why are we here? I'd like to just get this to be highly interactive from the very beginning. My question to all of you, hundreds of you have shown up in the evening uh, in March to hear some guy from Connecticut talk about emotional intelligence. Why are you here? Literally. Uh, and by the way, this is not a rhetorical question. So in the chat, Let's hear it. To learn and grow. To learn, to learn, to be a better parent. Because you care about your daughter, thank you. To connect, curiosity. Because the world's a scary place right now. Uh, understand people better, understand my child, to learn and grow, to be curious for my kids. All right, to regulate emotions. All right, thank you all for sharing that. To better express your emotions and to pay attention to your children's emotions. So here, I just have to say up front that oftentimes when I do these presentations on emotional intelligence for families, families show up and they um, they think, Mark's going to teach me how to be or how to raise an emotionally intelligent child. Um, I'm going to, to be honest with you, I've had some parents say, isn't your presentation really about how I get my kid into Yale? <laughs> Which, by the way, this is not the presentation for that. Anyhow, um, and, uh, and they leave this presentation thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got some work to do. You know, maybe this is all about me as a parent learning, like all of you were saying, to be the best possible role model for my children in the development of emotional intelligence. So we're going to do a little bit of both tonight. Now, what I wanted to start off with was the survey. So firstly, thank you to many of you who took the survey. Um, I had a chance to look at your data, obviously anonymously. And... Um, I thought what I would start off my presentation with tonight are kind of the, the two co questions that I asked all of you um, and at first, which were, what are you concerned about? And what do, you, what do you hope for for your kids? So here we go. So when I asked you the question about your concerns, what you shared uh, was, the, the large percentage of you, 44% of you, said, my concern is my child's mental health and well-being. Second was physical and emotional safety. Third was high quality education. Fourth was social media and tech addiction kind of stuff. And fifth was kind of dealing with bullying or negative social interactions. So just take a moment to think about that. Firstly, um, I just want you to notice that the, the majority you know, of the things that you're concerned about are in the realm of emotional intelligence, right? Mental health and well-being, being able to regulate and having physical and emotional safety. High quality education, we can put that aside, but I'm here to tell you that an emotionally intelligent school is a school that provides higher quality education. Um, certainly dealing with social media, and for sure, I've done a tremendous amount of research on bullying and how to respond to bullying. And um, when you think about it, people who engage in bullying behaviors are generally not using emotions very wisely or being emotionally intelligent. Now, the second question was, what do you hope for your kid? And so here are the results of that study. The number one hope you have is not that your child has a high GPA. The number one thing that you hope for your kids is that your child graduates high school have, having taken C, uh, AP classes or has perfect SAT scores or even GRE scores. The number one thing 
that you people, all of you shared was, I want my kid to be happy. I want my child to have well-being. And I want my child to have life satisfaction. The second, I want my child to enjoy their what they do with their lives. I want them to have a career. I want them to work um, and, um, and enjoy that. The third, that was interesting, is I want my kid to be financially stable, <laughs> which I think is quite interesting. The fourth, meaningful and healthy relationships. And I thought the fifth is interesting too. That and, and interesting enough, when I analyzed the data, it came up as separate from like financial stability and security um, and career satisfaction. Is that you just want your kid to have a job? Um, so I want you to take a moment and look at these data again. These are from the aggregate of all of you. The top thing that you want for your kid is for them to be happy to have greater well-being and life satisfaction. You want them to actually have purpose and meaning and enjoy their work. Um, obviously have financial stability and importantly, um, healthy relationships. So let's just pause here for a minute. Does this resonate with you? I mean, they are your data. I didn't make this up, but what do you think? Would you, I'm getting some thumbs up, I see. It resonates. Um, and so I want you to keep in mind that, you know, my presentation tonight is going to be about what I call the other side of the report card. And I know because I've worked in, by the way, uh, you know, that, Janine, you got my bio from my book, which was published a couple of years ago. We were in 2000 schools. As of today, we are in 5,000 schools across 27 countries. So we have grown a lot over the last couple of years, proud to say. And we've reached 4 million children, have worked with over 200,000 educators. And I just want to emphasize that emotional intelligence is kind of this, what I like to call sometimes the other side of the report card. I don't know about all of you, but growing up, I grew up in New Jersey, you can tell from my hair. Um, we didn't, there was no such thing as an emotional intelligence education, right? I don't know. Give me a, in the chat, I'm curious, how many of you believe that when you were growing up, wherever you grew up, whatever state, whatever country, whatever schools you went to, that there was a strong emphasis in the development of your emotional intelligence skills. I'm getting one definitely, the rest nada, nothing at all. Absolutely not in caps. Yeah. And it's, I think, you know, we're gonna get into this tonight. There's a reason for that. And it's something that we all have to work on. Now, of course, I run the Center for Emotional Intelligence and I wrote a book called Permission to Feel. So I got to ask you how you're all feeling. If you're familiar with my book or with Ruler, which is our evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning, then you've seen this tool called the Mood Meter or El Medidor Emocional. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about feelings tonight. X-axis says pleasantness. All of you showed up tonight. Congratulations. Um, either you were forced here by your significant other, or maybe you were highly intrinsically motivated. I'm not sure. But you have feelings. And the way we can identify feelings more precisely is to break our emotional life up into different pieces. So pleasantness is what's going on for you in your brain right now. Plus five. Your brain is saying something like, this is going to be the best night of my life. Minus five, you're saying to yourself, is this over yet? Like, what is happening? I cannot believe I am in a room virtually with some guy talking about feelings. This is ridiculous. So where are you tonight? From minus five to plus five. 
Now on the y-axis, it says energy. Energy has to do with your level of activation. So do you feel energized or do you feel depleted? What's your energy like? Where are you? What's your body telling you? Are you like ready to fall asleep? Or are you like, come on, Mark, let's go. And of course, what we do is we create our millimeter from our two axes, yellow, red, blue, and green. So in the chat, and I want audience participation, which quadrant are you in tonight? Right now at 7.19 p.m. I got two yellow so far. I got blue, someone's got COVID, I'm sorry to hear that. We got some oranges, we got some yellows. By the way, uh, I got blues, yellow, 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 green. Okay, so if you're um, a family and you have kids, um, maybe this is like your family in the morning. One of you wakes up in the yellow, one of them wakes up in the blue, one of them is in the red, the other one's the Zen master in the green. Makes sense when you go to work. Um, if you work on a team, everybody's coming in with different feelings. And so the question is like, what do we do with all this feeling stuff? A lot of people tell me, Mark, we just, I leave my feelings at the door. How many of you believe that you can leave your feelings in your bedroom or leave your feelings at the door when you go to work? Yeah, it's not possible, just to let you know. So the first thing we got to do is we got to get granular. And I love that word, granular. So now what I want to know is what is your specific feeling for tonight? You got three seconds. Two. One. In the chat. How are you feeling? Go. We got some anxiety. Hopeful. Tired. Okay. Exhausted. Interested. Discontent. Tired. Discouraged, curious, anxious, and happy, pleasant, exhausted, tired, worried, curious, and tired, inquisitive, overwhelmed, excited to learn. All right, again, now I've got more data. I've got a room filled with people who are anticipatory, calm, anxious, overwhelmed, curious, tired. Like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Ignore it. All right. Before we move forward, quick question for all of you. Give me a yes in the chat if you found it slightly challenging to find the precise feeling word. It is hard. So Jenny, I'm gonna ask you to come on down to the new show on emotional intelligence. Hi. Well, thank I, you I know for I was I was one of your um, you know, red or somewhere on the anxious meter since you threw out to me that I was gonna get back up here to be on stage with you tonight. <laughs> All right, I'll make sure that your job is easy. Okay, um so Janine, well let me um how are you feeling tonight? Now that now that now that now that you're you were a little red, so you're a little nervous or anxious? Um yeah, and I'm I was I'm anticipating, I was interested. Um, and how were you feeling before I said that, you know, just half hour ago? I was pretty calm, actually, because I was like, I've done this before. I know I'm, I know what's happening. So I was calm. <laughs> Interesting, right? So you're, you're, what you're saying is that your feelings can shift like that. Absolutely. Like when you've had a good day as a, you're a parent, I know that, and your kid comes home and they're like, I hate school or I can't stand this. And all of a sudden you went from having that calm day to being activated. Does that ever happen? I mean, yes, it happens <laughs> often, often. <laughs> I think there's a saying that you're only as uh, happy as your happiest child or yes. something along those lines, right? Yes. But you probably get easily activated by kids and other family members. Um, so let me, uh, I want you to ask me how I'm feeling now. Mark, how are you feeling tonight? Fine. Fine. Yeah, really, Mark? Fine. <laughs> Let's be honest. How many of us, when we're asked the question, how are you feeling? 99.9% .9 of the time, what do we say? Fine. Good. Okay. 
Ask me again if you don't mind, Janine. How are you feeling, Mark? Oh, gosh. Honestly, um, I just got a lot going on. I think I mentioned to you, I'm starting my next book, which I'm overwhelmed by because it's like now I got a whole thing to write. And um, I have a septic tank problem in my house, which is freaking out. You know, my dogs, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have two dogs. I got them during COVID. You know, I've got a team of 60 people. Everybody now wants to work from home. They want to work from here. They want to work from there. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm like anxious, overwhelmed, excited, nervous, and hopelessly optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, shit. like, why do we hire this guy to come in to give a speech? Um, but like, let's be honest, everybody. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That you can have a day. Um, that is filled with all of these, you know, like 15 feelings. It's, that's what our life is like. Um, and so the first thing is, are we granular? And that's, this is from the inside cover of my book. So there are actual feeling words that we can learn to be more specific and precise. We're going to do a little exercise on that later on. But here's the big question that I'm going to ask everyone to take a moment and think about. Well, not yet, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you my national data. And these are 100% aligned with your data, by the way. The number one emotion that adults share that they've been feeling is anxiety. And among children, elementary, middle, and high school, the top emotions, frustrated, anxiety, bored, confused, worried, overwhelmed. It's kind of all over the place. Now, the question is when you're asking your children or you're asking your partners, the question, how are you feeling? Are you getting anxiety, frustration, overwhelm, worried, uncertain? Or are you getting fine, good, okay. And so my big question for all of you tonight is the following. What's really involved in the question, how are you feeling? Now, don't answer yet. And Virginia, if you, you, can, you can go back to your contentment place. Thank you. Um, and so for everyone, I want you to just take a moment and pause. This is your time to take a nice long inhale and a nice long exhale and be present. That's the big thing in California these days. Everyone wants to be present. So take a nice long inhale and exhale. And I want you to ask yourself, what's really involved in the question, how are you feeling? And I want you to think about it from the parent asking the child. And I want you to think about it from the child being authentic in their response. Okay, take a moment. Okay, in the chat, what are you thinking about? What came up for you? What's involved? How are you coping? Are you okay? Trust, vulnerability. We want to know that our kid is okay. How can I support you? Concern, authentic conversations, curiosity, be real. They have to be able to identify their feelings to answer the question, genuine concern, connection. Yeah, really good responses. And so these are some of the ideas that I've summarized from my research. The first is, do I trust you? Am I going to be my true feeling self with you? The second is, do I even get asked the question? Or to say, how was your day? Fine. What's up? Good or nothing? Another question is, do we have time? Like, are you willing to listen uh, to what you hear? I've had parents say, like, I'm not going to ask my kid how I'm feeling in the morning. I got to get to work. Like, I don't have time. I'm like, are you aware of what you just said? <laughs> do I have the vocabulary? And 
if I share with you something other than fine, good, okay, great, but sad, down, disappointed, devastated, hopeless, despair, or worried, or anxious, or overwhelmed, do I believe that you can support me? How many of you, does this resonate? That maybe, you know, the how are you, how are you feeling has become more of like this superficial greeting as opposed to a genuine, deep question around connecting with people. So as you can imagine, my goal is to help people develop the skills, right? So that this question becomes a real question uh, where people feel like they can be authentic and honest in their responses, where people also can support each other. How many of you think that's a good idea? Because otherwise, maybe I should just go have a glass of wine. What do you think? In the chat, are we good with this? Are we good with the goals here? I'm getting hearts and thumbs being raised. All right, cool. So you saw um, in my introduction, and, and Janine mentioned that um, I wrote this book called Permission to Feel. For our Spanish speakers, it's Permiso para sentir. And, um, you know, it's funny, I had a meeting today with my publisher and my uh, writing agent, and I was reminding them that when I was writing this book, they didn't love the title. They were like, permission to feel, I don't know, Mark. like, that sounds a little touchy-feely. I'm a little nervous that, you know, no one's going to want to read a book called Permission to Feel. People are going to be like embarrassed to have a book and hold it up in the air called Permission to Feel. Um, and um, I said, do you realize that all of the defensiveness uh, that you're coming up with around it is the reason why I'm calling it that? Like, we're not... We're not going to, you know, keep on like running away from the deeper issue here. And so permission to feel. Why? What does it mean? Well, so you, none of you know me that well. And so let me do my now, like not my bio. It's like the Yale University professional bio, but give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I am 53. All of you are supposed to be like, oh, is that possible? Look at you. Anyway, I am 53, um, and uh, I was born in New Jersey. I had two parents uh, who loved me dearly. I would say that neither of my parents went to the Graduate School of Emotional Intelligence. Um, good people love me dearly, uh, but their ways of dealing with emotions, you know, not so great. Mom was basically had a lot of anxiety and she would say things like, I can't handle what's happening. I'm having a breakdown. My father, you know, we call my father, Mr. Toxically Masculine these days. He would say things like, son, you got to toughen up. Son, I want you to toughen up. Just so you know, I've got a fifth degree black belt now. I'm still not a tough guy, but I can protect myself and other people. Now, one thing that I didn't share um, up until I was 48 years old uh, was that, and I'm just going to be real with all of you, is that very sadly, um, I was abused as a child. So um, my one of my parents' best friends was um, a pedophile and uh, was quite abusive to me in my early childhood for about five years of my life, to be frank and honest. And to this day, I wonder, like, why didn't I share? You know, what would, how could I not have shared what was happening to me? Well, obviously, um, there are many reasons. One is, you know, um, when your mom is having a breakdown every day, you probably think to yourself as a kid, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to activate mommy. She's going to have a breakdown if I tell daddy, who's just telling me to toughen up all the time, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's going to just tell me, he's going to, well, I don't know. Point is that I didn't feel safe or comfortable to even disclose my own experience to my parents. Nor were they, I think, fully present in my development to notice. But I was very fortunate still that I had an uncle. His name is Uncle Marvin, who I dedicate my 
book to and my entire career to, who was a middle school teacher in the Catskill Mountains of New York State and also a trumpet player, who happened to be writing a curriculum when I was 10 years old, teaching kids about feelings. And he was living with us one summer because he was going to graduate school near where I grew up. And we were sitting in the backyard. And he looked at me like no adult had ever really looked at me before. And he just said, Mark, how are you feeling? But really, how are you feeling? And it was that moment that I decided to be my true self and share about all the pain I was going through from the bullying and the abuse. And he didn't say, I'm gonna have a breakdown or toughen up. What he said was, we're gonna get through this together. And so I've been really curious um, as a scientist, not only as a person who had lived experience, but as a scientist, you know, how many people had an Uncle Marvin, had a mentor who supported them in their healthy development? And I asked all of you that question, and here's what the research shows. Just 45% of you. 45% of all of you who are here tonight, that means 55% of you did not believe that you had someone in your development who was there for you. And then I asked you, and I've asked this, by the way, I have a national study of thousands of people. What are the characteristics of the people who give us permission to feel? And look at these characteristics. This is from the national sample. This is thousands of people in education and business, mental health field, everybody. Good listener, non judgmental, empathic, compassionate. Denise or Dennis, I'm not sure. Um, we had about 200 people complete the survey. Um, so I mean, this is a typo in the slide. I made a mistake because I was editing earlier. This is my national data. This is all of you. By the way, I know private school parents are supposed to be special people, but you look awfully similar to the real world. Non-judgmental, good listener, empathetic or empathic, loving, caring, kind, supportive. I wanna go a little deeper with this with you because one of my largest concerns is that when I ask people about the person who gave them permission to feel. Only about 5% of that 45% said it was their mom or their dad or a caregiver. Take a moment and digest that, please. The characteristics of the people who give us permission to feel are non judgmental loving, good listener, caring, empathic, and kind. But yet when we think about our childhoods and that the people who created those conditions for us, only 5% of us say that it was our parent. So I'm, you know, maybe you thought I was just going to be lecturing and all night, but I need us to reflect a little bit. I need some, some co-thinking here. What's the barrier? What is preventing every one of you on this webinar from being your child's own Uncle Marvin? I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that. And if you feel comfortable, please type that into the chat. So we didn't get that modeling. Time. The toxic cycle is hard to break. Fear, stress, parents are busy with logistics, don't know the right thing to say or do. 
acceptance. We need our own permission. Nothing. We just need to get learn how to do it. Don't know how. Expectations. Overwhelm with schedules. I think it's a value proposition, just to be frank. I believe it's a value proposition. I think that we as a society have deemed emotional life as weak. And so we'll make the time to get our kids tutors. We'll make the time to do extra sports coaching. Um, but we're not making the time to be the non-judgmental, good listening, loving, caring, empathetic people. I'm fascinated by it. I have to just tell you. Uh, I'm still, I still, every time I present data like this, I just, I sit back and think, what is getting in the way? And um, maybe we just don't know how to be good listeners. Maybe we don't know um, how to be non-judgmental. I think I saw, I think Cynthia are making a good point, this desire to fix the fear piece. I had a mom, and then my favorite was recently I did a presentation and a mom said to me, gosh, I realize now I have to get my child. My daughter has an Uncle Marvin, but my son doesn't. And I'm going to do everything I can to find an Uncle Marvin for my son. And I looked at the mom and I said, have you thought about you? Um, just putting it out there. It's like we're outsourcing, right? The, uh, the Uncle Marvins. Okay. How are we feeling, by the way? Is this going okay for everybody? Yes? What's our feeling now? So, all right. Well, here's the thing. People are wanting, like, everybody comes to these uh, webinars or these trainings to, um, with, they want takeaways. So, how many of you feel like you have, I, I, I think we have like two major takeaways right now. The first is self-awareness is a gift. Can everybody repeat that in your own home? Self-awareness is a gift, right? Being aware, aware of our feelings is a gift. We gotta build that vocabulary. Second is everyone needs to be an Uncle Marvin, period. And that, you can't be an Uncle Marvin to everybody, but you can certainly be the Uncle Marvin to your own child, which means that if all of you were saying the characteristics of the people that created the conditions for me to be my true self were non-judgment, that's a big one these days, huh? We're just so judgmental. Why are you wearing that? Why are you doing that? Why, 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 why? The second, good listening skills, right? I mean, that takes being present. That takes stepping back and just asking good questions. And the third, empathy and compassion. So self-awareness is a gift. And you're all going to strive to be Uncle Marvin's. Yes? Now, I'll be honest, some of you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I want more data. Well, guess what? That's what I do for a living. And actually, I've published 200 papers since that was written. So we've got more papers to share with you. I think what everybody needs to know is that emotions matter for everything. Emotions matter for attention, memory, and learning, decision-making, relationship quality, physical and mental health, and performance and creativity. Yeah, so Teresa, that's a great question. The thing is that when you are fixing or trying to provide a solution, what you're not doing is helping your child develop the critical thinking skills they need, right, to deal with their emotions when you're not around. And that's the ideal thing we want to do. And I think what's important to add on to that is that the, um, the process of diving deeply into the problem-solving process 
is a tremendous gift to people. Now, it doesn't mean that you just like say, you know, hey, kiddo, figure out how to get resilient and you're on your own. No, obviously it's a relational piece and we have something we call co-regulation. So just beware. Now, think about this for a minute. How we feel drives where our brains spend time. So if you're stressed or overwhelmed, right? What happens, your brain goes into fight flight mode, not learning mode. Just to be frank, I was a C and D student growing up. And you might be thinking to yourself, this guy's brilliant, how is that possible? But the truth is, I was a C and D student. And it obviously is not because of my cognitive ability, because truth be told, I'm a really smart guy. I had abuse, I was being bullied being neglected. I'm in survival mode, not learning mode. With everything that's happened in our society, with divisive politics, with wars, with COVID, people are in the same fight flight mode. It's hard to be a good learner. It's hard to make informed decisions, to build, maintain relationships, to have good mental health and to be our best selves when we're constantly activated. So two things have to happen. One is we got to change our society. And two is we got to help people develop the skills. It's a both hand. So here's another takeaway. Not only do I want you to be self-aware, not only do I want you <clears throat> to give yourself and your children permission to feel, I want you to go a little further and I want you to strive to be an emotion scientist and not an emotion judge. So what does that mean? Open, curious, and reflective. All emotions are information. Here's another big takeaway. Everybody write this down. There is no such thing as a bad emotion. Let me repeat myself. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. All emotions are data. All emotions are useful information. Anxiety lets us know that there's uncertainty in the world. Anger tells us there's an injustice. Disappointment reminds us that we had an unmet expectation. Doesn't have bad emotions. And by the way, we're feeling them all the time. So if we think they're bad, then what are we going to do? Deny, repress, ignore, eat, bang our heads against the wall? Take a moment to think about this. The emotion judge, critical, closed, emotions are error. People who like basically say, why are you so angry? Clump emotion is good or bad, fixed mindset. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna give you an example. Um, the pandemic hit, March, actually, it's, right? What is this week? This is the week, everyone. This is the third year, right? This is our, th literally it's three years this week that the world shut down. Um, <clears throat> where were you three years ago when the world shut down? Well, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, uh, who's from Panama, came for a family wedding that was the end of February. And little did we know that all flights to Panama would be shut down in March and April and May and June and July, and August, there were no freaking flights to return this lady to Panama <laughs> until September. And, you know, I love this. I love my mother-in-law. We get along for the most part, but we've never been together for seven freaking months. And so after about the third month, <clears throat> things were getting pretty ugly. And there was one night we were at dinner and this was getting just like everybody's on everybody's nerves. Anybody remember those days? Anybody remember like the first few months where it's like we're out of our minds? Like, remember we're like windexing our grapefruits? Anybody remember those days and using the little wipets on our doorknobs? We were all pretty stressed out. And um, she looked at me and she said in a very angry voice, are you really the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence? 
And I was so irritated. I just looked back and said, not tonight. Let me ask all of you, how many of you can relate to one of those nights during the first six months? I cannot be the only one. And so why am I sharing this with you? Because the fixed mindset, the emotion judge says, you know, this is who I am. Get over it. Not great for relationship building. The emotion scientist goes to bed that night and says, gosh, something really got under my skin. What was that? What was I triggered by? What's going on for me right now? Why did I feel like it was okay to have that kind of crude response? And even more importantly, what might I do differently tomorrow? How might I re apologize and try to repair? So clearly, what I'm looking for is a world filled with emotion scientists. And we're going to kind of like, kind of, Move away those emotion judges. All right, so take home number three. Everyone, how many of you feel like you can make an effort towards being an emotion scientist? Give me a yes. Thumbs up, yes. You're going to be open and curious and reflective. When you fail, you're going to be like, everybody fails. It's okay. Tomorrow's another day. The emotion judge, we're going to leave those for the courtroom, not for our relationships. Okay. So now we're going to give each other permission to feel. We're going to be emotion scientists, not emotion judges. And we're going to commit our, we're going to make a commitment to developing real skills, okay? Real skills, not soft skills. I know a lot of you are in the business world, entertainment world, legal professions, medical professions, other professionals. And so often people like take emotional intelligence and they say, oh, that's soft skills. I'm gonna tell you right now that these soft skills are so much harder than the hard skills to learn and apply, and that we need to wipe that term right out of our brains. So first, recognizing emotions. We're gonna do a little game tonight. I'm gonna actually stop sharing for a moment. You know, see me now, you got, you got my whole head. I'm gonna make a facial expression. And all of you are going to type into the chat what emotion I'm displaying, okay? Let me come off video for a second. Three. No, no, that's not, I'm not asking you to look at the picture. I'm going to make a facial expression. Do not use that. To, that was, that's just my, that's my, uh, my screenshot. Here we go. That's me in, in a school, by the way. But I'm going to show you my facial expression. So just everybody relax. You're so eager to participate. Here we go. Okay, what was I showing? So let's um, let's look at this. Some people thought I was content. Some people thought I was fake listening. Some people thought I was uninterested, disappointed, confused, skeptical, open, content, content, caring, angst, bored, pleased, thinking, indifferent, impatient, for real, condescending, kind, not interested, incredulousness, really? Fake interest, maybe annoyed, annoyed. All right, so um, withholding, got some like psychoanalyst on this team, polite boredom, contempt, ambivalence, smug, I have no idea. Are you kidding me? Disappointed, indifferent, skeptical, irritated. Jesus. All right. So clearly, um, 
clearly the parents in Los Angeles need some serious training in emotional intelligence. But um, so everyone, what's the emotion? Who's right? Because we got everything from contempt, condescending to contentment and happiness and calm. You're all right, Alina? Come on, how is that possible? How can I be both contemptuous and content? So someone is saying, it's in the eye of the beholder. Nice point. You're all right if your emotion judges. Because you all think you're right because you're the emotion judge. If you're an emotion scientist, thank you. You got to ask. Because here's the magic. Not the magic. Here's the challenge. It's much harder than we think it is to read people's feelings. And the other challenge is that we all think we're right when we do it. Like one of our participants here. We're all like, I'm certain Mark was condescending. I'm certain Mark was disappointed. I'm certain Mark was content. I'm certain Mark was this. How could you be certain when you're not in my brain? So what's another lesson for tonight? You don't really know how someone's feeling until you ask them how they're feeling. And what we want to do is we want to move away from attributing emotion to people and learning more about how they feel. Is that that's a it's a fancy little concept there. We want to move away from attributing emotion to people and become skilled at building intimacy, trust, positive relationships so that we can ask people how they feel so they can tell us the truth. What do you think? Good idea? And then you bring in other things like gender and race and age, and all of a sudden it gets much more complicated. So someone's asking me, how was I feeling? I was trying to be calm, just calm. Of course, now I realize why I have no friends because I'm trying to be calm and everybody's like, what's up, Mark? You know, what's up with him? He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's feeling disgust. He's angry. He's irritable. I'm just trying to be nice and say hi. And was, hi. Okay. All right. Recognizing emotions. The second skill. Understanding emotions. Why am I feeling this way? Where's my feeling coming from? The third skill, labeling feelings. Do I have the vocabulary? Oh, I forgot. I'm going to put my slides back up. Hold on. So here's a big question for you. During the pandemic, I asked, a million people, because everybody is telling me they're anxious. And then people are saying they're overwhelmed. And some of the people are saying they're stressed. And then some people said they were kind of feeling fear. And I'm like, does anybody really know the difference between and among these emotions? That's my question to all of you. What's the difference? What do you think? What is the difference between anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, and overwhelmed? Anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, overwhelm. Oh my. How we react. They're all the same. So for the person who said that, wrong answer. Sorry. I had a bunch of CEOs of a company. I did this uh, presentation for a, a Fortune 100 company. All these, not the CS, but the major executive executive team. I'm like, all right, so anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, and overwhelmed. Oh my, what's the difference? They're like, ah, it's all the same stuff. I'm like, sorry, that's too easy. Control. You have to ask, what causes it? 
What do you think? What are the differences? They're self-imposed. Some are internal, some are external. Anxiety is about uncertainty. Stress is present time. Pressure is external. Fear is way more complicated. Overwhelmed is all of them at once. That's pretty good. All right. Because of time, I'm going to show you the cheat sheet. Anxiety, uncertainty about the future, stress, too many demands, not enough resources, pressure, something at stake is dependent upon your behavior, fear, feeling as if there's impending danger, overwhelmed, just overcome by your feelings. Now that I've shown you this slide, how many of you think that more precisely labeling your experience would be helpful in finding the best strategy to regulate the feeling. Hundred percent. Because when you're anxious and your brain is perseverating, like I remember when the coronavirus when it first hit three years ago, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the, my universe is shutting down. How am I going to lead? How am I going to run the center? What's going to happen? When is it going to open up? And then what's the vaccines? And what's this? And what's this? And, you know, and people were like, breathe. I'm like, I take my breath and I go back to freaking out. Thank you very much for the breathing exercise. <laughs> and so like breathing has become the answer to all of life's problems. Now, granted, I like to breathe. It's important and it helps with certain feelings, but it can't be the solution to all of our life's problems. And then I was like, yoga. I'm like, yoga? I love yoga, but like, I got too much stuff on my plate and I can't get it all done. Now you want me to take time out of my day and go do yoga? Like, I got, I'm stressed out. And so, again, yoga is good. I practice yoga. I went to yoga before this presentation. I did an hour and a half hot yoga class before this presentation, just to let you know. But that's because I was dealing with being overwhelmed. And I just needed some space, just saturated. I had a long, busy day. I'm like, I'm going to go sweat it out. And then I came and here I am, being perfectly present for all of you. But um, if I'm anxious, I got to work on my cognitions. I got to help myself not ruminate, right? Help myself not constantly worrying about what's not happening in the future or what is happening. If I'm stressed, I got to take stuff off my plate or get help. If I'm pressure, which by the way, is a top feeling among my students because of their parents texting them all the time, what's happening, what are you doing your test? Then going to yoga is not gonna solve the pressure. It's having the difficult conversation with parents saying, mom, dad, give me some space. Sorry for that one. By the way, among undergraduates, college students, which your students will be at some point perhaps, what do you think the number one feeling is? The number one emotion? Guess. Stress, fear, pressure. And, okay, so here it is. They say stress. However, when I interview them, and I say, tell me what's really going on for you. Like, what's making you feel stressed? It has nothing to do with any of these feelings. Do you know what the number one true emotion is among high school kids and college students? You got it. It's envy. Envy is the number one emotion. Because everything is about social comparisons. And so if we don't help our kids... decrease the social comparisons. They're going to continuously say they're stressed and overwhelmed and afraid. And it's not going to be helpful because we're going to do quick fixes like mindfulness classes and yoga. When what they really need to do is work on how they think about themselves and their cognitive structuring. 
Does this make sense, everybody? That until we get really precise, we're not doing our kids justice. We're not doing giving them the, the skills they need to navigate their emotional lives. We're just superficial about the whole thing. Okay. So we got to label it. We got to recognize. And we know that we're going to make a lot of mistakes. So we got to ask people. We got to build our vocabulary. We have to be comfortable expressing our feelings, right? We know that there are differences in society about who has the privilege to express. I did a study with 14,000 people in the workforce. Women say they feel less comfortable expressing emotions as they progress in ranks because it's expected that they express certain emotions, not other emotions, called the emotional glass ceiling for women in the workplace. It's an equity issue. Certainly, we know in our society that people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds don't feel as safe expressing their emotions. Um, and by the way, uh, yes, uh, envy is across uh, boys and girls, men and women. And then the final skill that we're going to talk about is regulating emotion. All of the strategies that we need to deal with our emotions. Now, before I show you my final few slides, I want to ask you a question. When you mess up as a parent, when you say the thing, you're like, oh, or when you do something, um, what tends to be your self-talk? What tends to be your go-to way of talking to yourself? Honestly, what are some of the things that you say to yourself when you mess up as a parent? Damn it, I'm an idiot, right? I'm shitty, I'm a failure, right? You botched it up again, you're the worst parent ever. I'm just like my mother. I'm messed up, I'm blanked up, I, you know, yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? And so, again, where did that come from? Do you think you were born with an air of your brain that said things like, I'm a loser, I suck, I screwed up, duh, I've become my father, I'm such a jerk. What do you think? How many of you think you were born that way? The answer is, Lady Gaga was wrong. We were not born that way. <laughs> it's a great song. But this was learned. All of your strategies for dealing with emotions were learned. Every one of them. You just have to understand that. That through osmosis, through observation, through television, through social media, through parents, every one of our strategies is learned. And what that means is that we can unlearn some of that negative stuff that we've learned, that unhelpful stuff that we've learned. And what we can do is replace it with helpful strategies. Wouldn't that be nice? So you might be asking, well, Mark, what are the strategies? And of course, that's a lot to do in a webinar. Um, if you want to learn more about these strategies, you can just read my book and go deeper into these strategies because this is the real kind of, you got to read about this, you got to practice it. But I'm here to share with you that there are kind of core strategies. The first is permission to feel. No bad emotions. The second is that self-awareness piece. The third is that you got to manage your body's budget. And what I mean by that is that your sleep quality, the food you eat, and the movement you get in your life are all correlated with how well you deal with your emotions. They are. Poor sleep means you haven't replenished, which means you're going to have a shorter fuse, period. You do have to learn how to quiet the noise. I always tell people, you got to deactivate before you can regulate. When our children, you know, like, I can't stand you. I'm not going to school tomorrow. We get hijacked. We go into survival mode. You can't problem solve when you're in survival mode or in fight mode. It doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work 
is that the air of your brain that kind of can apply those healthy strategies isn't available to you. If you ever take, give this, think of it as an example. We all love our partners, at least we try to. <laughs> and when you're pissed, really pissed, how many of you in that moment of you're pissed, think about that great date you had five years ago. You can't even think about it. Isn't that amazing? You can't bring up all those memories when you're activated. All you think about is that when we first met 27 years ago, I knew it wasn't going to work out. That's what comes up for you. And so until we can learn how to deactivate, take the breaths, bring the temperature down so that we can go back to our calm state, we're not going to be able to problem solve with our kids. Another take home message, everybody chant after me. You got to deactivate to regulate. You got to deactivate to regulate. The last three, we got to have our self-talk. We've got to work on our self-talk. Got to shift from self-criticism to self-compassion. Mark, take the high road. Mark, you can get through this. Mark, you know this frustration is impermanent. All that helpful self-talk. The third is we can't do it alone. We're social creatures. We need more Uncle Marvins. The fourth is something really interesting that I want you to look at here. Another no, fourth, the last one here is I want you to analyze your day. Because a lot of you said that you couldn't be an Uncle Marvin because of time. Just saying, you said it, it's in the chat. I want you to look at your calendars and I want you to analyze your calendar for the A's, the B's and the C's. The A's are, I got to do this. There's no way. The B's are, I could do this or maybe somebody else could do it. The C's are, why the heck am I wasting my time doing this? I've done this for years and I do it constantly. I'm letting you know right now that probably at least 20 to 30% of your day is C. Think about how much time that is that you can dedicate towards practicing these healthy strategies, working on them for yourself and being more present for your kid. So let's all take a nice long inhale and a nice long exhale. I'm gonna spend one more minute just to share a few last things then we're gonna ask Janine to come back on to give me some Q and A. But I wanna share with you, for those of you unfamiliar, what this looks like in 5,000 schools. So there are tools, tools to help create a more positive climate. As a matter of fact, you can do this as a family. You can build your family emotional intelligence charter. But we don't just ask people how they feel. We ask them, how do you want to feel? And right now, people are saying, I want to be inspired. I want to feel fulfilled. And we say, okay, well, if you want to feel that way, let's create a learning environment where we feel that way. Everyone learns from the superintendent or the head of school to the director of admissions or the director of development, they need to learn this one, to teachers, to students, the mood meter, building that vocabulary, checking on the mood meter, playing games with the mood meter, artwork uh, with the mood meter, building a whole football field. These are a group of private schools in Mexico that use ruler. They build a whole football field with the mood meter. Tools to help parents and children and teachers be their best selves. Think about this phrase by Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space lies our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and freedom. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could teach people how to build the space between stimulus and response and have healthy strategies? That's the goal of Ruler. I love this one. This is a fourth grade student in Los Angeles, actually. Um, I was visiting a private school in LA and I loved it because this kid's best self, he said, I'm, I wanna be kind. I wanna be hardworking. I wanna be determined. I wanna be selfless. 
like selfless. Are you kidding me? Because I visited this school and I saw this post. That's how I took a picture of it. And I went up to this little boy and I said, tell me how you came up with the word selfless to describe your best self. And he looked at me and goes, sir, I have determined that the world is becoming narcissistic. And I want to be a role model for what it means to be selfless. I'm like, okay, can I just bow to you? You're my teacher, man. To other tools to help people problem solve, we call it the blueprint. And so when we roll this work out in schools, it starts with the adults and students from preschool all the way to high school. We have outside of school time and family engagement. There's curriculum for the adults. And I just want to end by saying this work makes a difference in people's lives. That students, less anxiety, less depression, fewer, uh, more developed skills, fewer attention problems, better academic performance, greater leadership skills. Educators are more engaging, supportive, and effective, less burnout, greater job satisfaction. Classrooms are more positive places. And so to wrap up my time with you, a couple of things. One is you heard in my introduction that we do this work in companies, not just in schools. That's called OG Life Lab. So please check that out if you're interested and you're gonna get a copy of all this. You heard about the app. So I was very fortunate that during the pandemic, became close friends with Ben Silberman, the founder and CEO of Pinterest. And he said, can we work together to take your knowledge and my background in technology and merge it and build a tool that we can give away? And I was like, are you kidding me? Definitely. Um, and so we have now a million users of our app and um, really amazing. And so you can plot your feelings. You can check in. It's called How We Feel. Go into the Apple store and download it. It'll be on Android in about a month. Um, you can track your feelings. You can watch videos to learn how to regulate your feelings. So those strategies that I shared are all built in. And I'll end by just saying, um, one, you got to give yourself the permission to feel. And you got to give everyone you love. And even the people you don't love that much, you got to give them the permission too. Two, please try to be a parent as an emotion scientist. Don't be the judge. Nobody wants to be around the judge. Remember, these are skills, right? It's about accepting all feelings and using them wisely. I appreciate that this is life's work. Every day, you can be a beginner. Be the role model, right? If you fail, which you will, apologize, forgive, repair. Just embrace the complexity. People say, it's so complicated, Mark. I'm like, so what? A lot of the things are complicated. Let's give our emotional life some justice. And finally, um, I have big goals. You know, I want to create an emotion revolution, just to be frank with all of you. Like, I'm not stopping. I'm on, I'm on like, today I'm in my ruler bus and I got a beautiful stop here in uh, Los Angeles with all of you. And I'm grateful to be invited to present to all of you. And I, I'm on my, I'm on my bus, and I'm opening the door to my bus, and I'm praying and hoping that all of you want to get on that bus. And I know some of you want to sit in the back of the bus. I'm like, let me see what's going on here. Some of you are sitting in the front of the bus. By the way, I'll let all of you drive the bus. And so, my hope is that tonight was just the beginning of your learning, um, and that together we can build a healthier, more equitable, innovative, and compassionate society. I have learned in my 20 years as a scientist in this space, that there is no magic pill, but really working on our emotional intelligence can be a great place to start building a better world. And on that note, Janine, I wanna thank you again for inviting me and make sure we have like, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. And uh, if you wanna read more, you can obviously get the book or go to my website and um, over to you. Hi, I, I'm back here. How are you? Um, thank you so much uh, for that, honestly, and for the interactive program. I loved it. Um, you know, and we've been getting a lot of great response from the community, and I think that thank you, you did. Yeah, thank you so much. It's it's nice to see you again as well. Um, I, I think one thing that seems to be a theme um, is that people do think there's this difference between their boys and their girls expressing yeah. emotion. And so could you just speak to that a little bit? Like people want to know how to get their boys to speak more. Yeah. I mean, get so it's a really, really good question, Janine. And like, remember what I said that 
all of our negative self-talk is learned. Um, the same thing applies to the gender differences. We're not, people think all is biologic, biological stuff. No, it's that parents talk more about feelings with their, you know, in a binary way of talking about gender with their female children than they do with their male children. And um, that's where the gender differences emerge because we, we don't think that boys should be talked to with feelings talk. Um, and we think that girls should be. And so if we just shifted that behavior, we would see, you know, differences. I will tell you this, in my, you know, 20, 25 years of running around the world, I've never gone to a classroom where I haven't gotten every single boy to share how they're feeling and wanting to share it with me because I'm the role model. I say, you know, when I was your age, I had all these challenges. I'm just curious. Did anyone else have those, have those problems? I was like, I got them. I got them. Nobody ever asked me. Um, so please, you know, here's a good example. We have parents. Imagine this. I'm a dad. I come home from work. I had a really crappy day. And you're my daughter. Okay, Janine. And you're like, hi, daddy. Go ahead. Hi, how are you, Daddy? I want to tell you like all about my day. I just got. Honey, I've had a really. Honey, I've had a rough day. I need some. Honey, Daddy is not in a good place. I'm sorry. I gotta go. Uh, you know, we'll talk later at dinner. And I just that's what happens, right? I'm activated because I had a rough day at work. I don't have the time or space. I don't want to deal with it, and I just disappear. As opposed to, Janine, honey, gosh, I had a really rough day at work. I had a fight with one of my colleagues. I can't believe it. I had a fight with one of my colleagues, and I've been you know, he's a good friend and I was not so kind. And I've been upset about my behavior and I've been really thinking about what I can say to him tomorrow when I apologize. And so I may feel a little, I may look a little off tonight right now, but it's not because of you. It's because I'm just trying to deal with this. And after I, you know, think about some ways I can kind of deal with it tomorrow, we'll have dinner and everything will be great. Mm -hmm. So let's think about that for a minute. What I do as a dad, A, I was vulnerable. B, my kid knows I have feelings. C, my kid knows I make mistakes. D, my kid sees me problem solving. E, I'm comfortable sharing. I mean, I've done all of that. And so that's what I'm urging parents to do more of is age appropriate, healthy sharing so that you're being a role model, that it's safe and comfortable to talk about feelings and that you can problem solve out loud and let your kids see your process of how you're kind of working through the feeling with an effective strategy. I think that's great because one of the other things that's coming up that you're saying that is actually in, in that you're working in Mexico a lot because one of mm -hmm. the questions that's come up is about cultural differences. Yeah. Right? And you just uh, described something to me, which would like be a very like male way of like, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm, you know, it applies to females too, but it's typically yeah. a male stereotype, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of questions in the chat um, coming through asking like, what about cultural differences? You yeah. know, my husband and my wife grew up in a place where they don't share their emotions, or their feelings. Like, how do you deal with that? Great question. So we're always culturally sensitive in this work. There's no one way of sharing and there's no one correct way of regulating. Even emotion regulation is a product of our personalities and our culture. So it's super important. With that said, I think it's important, no matter, I'm doing work in China right now. People are like, oh my God, in China, like how are you gonna do work there? I'm gonna tell you right now, we're in like five provinces of China, 80% of it is universal. Everybody needs language to describe their inner experience. Now the words might be different. Some cultures have more words than other cultures. I, what I love about the cultural work is I've learned words like saudad, which is this Portuguese word that's like this like longing and mourning and complicated feeling. It's like, cool, I'm learning a new word. I learned a word during the pandemic in Sanskrit that's, um, oh gosh, now I just forgot it. Um, mudita, which is this beautiful word of like experiencing vicarious joy. Like, wow, that's kind of cool. 
like I want some more vicarious joy in my life. I, we don't have a word for that in English. I know. I was like, can we have an American word like that? <laughs> an English <Exactly>. word. <laughs> and so the um, we can learn from other cultures, and that doesn't, and it means that other cultures can learn from science. And so my question to people is, is it working for you? What are the like the suicide rates in some areas of China are outrageous, as they are here in the United States. And so something is not working. Can we have a conversation about the role of emotional intelligence and in helping people identify their feelings and having better strategies to regulate them? I'm not going to tell you how to regulate. I'm never going to do that. Just like I'm never going to tell you how you're feeling. But I'm going to support you in finding the strategies that work best for you, given your gender, your identity, and your culture. Mm -hmm. People also really want to know um, about this envy idea and that it crosses, mm -hmm. you know, across all of these sectors, you know, workers, college students, high school students, like the reason they're feeling these feelings of unhappiness and depression have to do with envy um, and the connection to social media with yeah. that. And, and like, you know, it's highly correlated. Okay. And, and, and what, what, what can we do about that? I think that, you know, when I did this work early on for Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, um, you know, I felt it was imperative that we create educational resources for families to understand this is a playground. It's just an unfamiliar playground for some parents. And so just like we need limit setting for how much time we watch television or how much time we spend doing things, we need to create boundaries for this. And having those boundaries is going to be helpful for everybody. You know, I'll show you, I'll tell you the, the thing is that kids are learning it, especially now, you know, millennial, you know, we're the millennial parents are teaching this to their kids because they're on their phones constantly. And so, you know, the, uh, and we've done research and others have done research, which shows that kids feel more, feel angrier and more disconnected um, from parents who are on their phones a lot. So again, let's be role models and let's have dinners where we put our phones in a basket and let's have movie nights where we don't text people while we're on the movies. You know, like we just have to, we're not, we're not taking it seriously enough that we need non-screen time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are so many more questions, but we don't have time. So I'm just going to ask you if there is one um, takeaway from everything that you spoke about tonight, um, you, what would be your one thing that you would advise to parents? I think my top thing is goes back to the being an Uncle Marvin, is that when we asked all of you about the people who you thought provided the greatest support for you. Many of you didn't mention your parents. You mentioned a teacher, a coach, an aunt or an uncle, someone outside of your family. And when I asked you what those strategies or what the, what the characteristics were of that person, you described someone who is non-judgmental. You described someone who is a good listener. And you described someone who showed empathy and compassion. So can you just set a goal tonight to just in the morning, maybe tomorrow morning, think about my best self as a parent is someone who listens, doesn't judge and shows empathy and compassion. Uh, it's a home run for me. Mark, thank you so much. Um, I just Thank you so much for being here tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Um, on yeah, behalf thank you. Of the entire solid board. Um, this was an amazing presentation. And I thank know you. from the responses that we got pre-survey and what people shared tonight that it was um, well well received and, and needed to be heard. So thank you so much. Thank you. Please stay in touch. Uh, Yes, for sure. Um, and if you'd like to purchase Mark's book, uh, Permission to Feel, Courtney will drop a link um, in the chat function okay. right now. Um, so once again, thank you to our member school representatives for being here and supporting us throughout the years. Um, if your school is not part of SALA and you'd like to become members, 
please contact us by reaching out to us on our website. Um, in the next week or so, you will also find a recording of Mark's talk on our website, which again, Courtney has dropped a link um, in the chat um, function for you to reach our site. So thank you again to all of our member schools for att attending and have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.